News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukat Ali. And very good evening to you and a warm welcome to Newsline Live. The economy is obviously the key subject at the moment. From north to south, from east to west, from the hills of Sri Lanka and everywhere else, the economy is impacting the people like we don't know how. And therefore, we thought we'd um, invite a guest who knows a thing or two about the economy and um, more uh, not to discuss the problems, but to look at the potential solutions to the problem. And in that respect, we've got here with us a um, gentleman for, uh, from uh, Verite Research. He's right here with us, uh, Mr. Deshal Demel. Very good uh, evening to you and welcome to the program. Thank you for us. Good to be back. And about four years ago, you probably yeah. came on the program. Now, Sri Lanka has just been um, uh, reclassified as a low middle income country. And um, we've. Uh, uh, per capita GDP was uh, sort of stuck in the $4,000 mark thereabouts. For Sri Lanka to be a uh, better developed nation, what should the per capita GDP be? Yeah, so the uh, Sri Lanka was at above 4000 slightly above $4,000 yeah. uh, per capita. And then after the, the shocks, after the Easter Sunday uh, shock, and then the, um, the more recent uh, pandemic, uh, growth actually came down quite significantly. We had negative growth in 2020. Um, and as a result, result of that, our per capita GDP actually declined below uh, $4,000 per capita. Mm. So technically, in order to kind of get back to that uh, upper middle income level, that 4000 threshold has to be crossed. Uh, but in order to do that, obviously, there needs significant changes in the overall economic structure, right? So right now, for instance, uh, Sri Lanka has uh, a lot of sectors that, are, um, that have limited uh, productivity. Mm -hmm. um, to take one example, the agricultural sector, for instance, employs about 20, 27, 28 percent of the labor force, mm -hmm. but only accounts for about 8 percent of GDP. Right, So that's clear in the sector, a, a substantial sector in terms of uh, deployment of resources, which doesn't yield significant amounts of uh, returns in terms of um, contribution to GDP. Um, and even beyond that, in, in the services sector, in manufacturing as well, there's a lot of room for greater productivity uh, enhancement. Uh, Sri Lanka's uh, exposure, to, for instance, to trade, to competition is uh, is also quite uh, limited. Right. Uh, so because of that, we have a uh, we have significant uh, gaps in terms of the overall productivity uh, in the economy across a number of sectors. And really, economies grow over the long term when productivity increases, when when sectors are exposed to competition, when there's greater uh, FDI. All of those factors contribute to ensure that um, uh, ensure that overall economic growth increases to the levels that are required to cross this 4,000 threshold once again. So <coughs> um, what, what did other countries do to get over this so-called uh, $4,000 per capita GDP sort of uh, trap, if you like? So if you take examples close to home, you look, go look at the ASEAN region, for instance. So that is one region where there are significant divergences in economic uh, economic uh, productivity, economic growth. So we have Singapore, which is a high income country, and you also have Laos and Cambodia, which are relatively low income countries. Mm. Now, what has happened in the ASEAN region is that they have very significant linkages in trade and investment. Right. So you have uh, a lot of production networks that go on, uh, and they've been able to attract significant investment from countries like Japan, countries like China, uh, and so on as well. Uh, so that has been one avenue in which they've been able to um, attract technology, attract uh, and be able to uh, attract technology transfer that has been able to infuse greater productivities in their economy. But, uh, you know, Sri Lanka has been stuck in this uh, 4K, $4,000 uh, per capita GDP for about six years now. Um, what does that mean? Does that mean the, uh, our governments have not done enough? What, 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 what is the, can we pinpoint and say, well, this is why? So there are a number of factors. Um, of course, you have issues in terms of uh, macroeconomic stability um, as well. So Sri Lanka, as we know, is, a, uh, is quite a, a highly leveraged uh, uh, country. We have uh, debt over 100% over of, uh, of GDP right now. We have high fiscal deficits. Um, and as a result of that, you have um, other constraints that make it 
that make uh, uh, more kind of uh, difficult in terms of attracting investment. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been, our credit rating has also been downgraded to uh, a C, triple C level, uh, which again, you know, it makes it more difficult to attract all sorts of, all sorts of investment, whether it's portfolio investments or FDI um, and the whole range. Um, so uh, those are, that is one, so macroeconomic stability is I think one uh, important factor. Um, access to land, uh, so for instance, most of Sri Lanka's BOI zones have uh, significant deficits in terms of availability of, uh, of land that is required for say, large scale manufacturing uh, establishments, uh, and also access to skills. Mm -hmm. So in Sri Lanka you have, um, you have access to, um, uh, to low scale labor, but you do have limitations in access to some of the higher scale labors that is required for uh, some of the kind of uh, investments that we really need to take us to the next level. Uh, it's interesting that you speak about skills because I did want to uh, talk to you about that. Um, um, uh, if I give you some figures, um, the student population, if you like, is uh, pro on average about 360,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, out of that, um, I wonder if you know what sort of amount, number, ends up in university. I would say around 30, 32,000. Yes, I mean, uh, that, that's right. In state universities, the capacity is 30,000. And also now we have the private universities, mm. so there's another 15,000. So right. that brings us to about 45,000 from the 360 that started off uh, their, their education system. Yeah. Um, and in terms of uh, all that, that's about 12.3%. 12 12 mm. There's another 79,200 who go into um, sort of vocational training. And that 79,200 is 22%. So combine the right. two, we've got around 34.3% of the student population mm. who, when they exit, have got some form of training, so a qualification, or they've got a degree, and so on. Yeah. But that leaves us with a unholy 65.7% of people who don't have any form of training or a degree at the end mm. for them to go on to greater things. So this 65.7% um, can Sri Lanka traverse this $4,000 per capita trap on this basis with 65% with of the, the students having left their education system without any qualification? Can we, can we manage? So uh, Sri Lanka has always had this long history of, you know, universal access to education, free education. Um, and I think we've gotten quite complacent in the last couple of decades, right? So we, we still talk about 90% plus literacy rates, but really um, other countries, the ASEAN countries, for instance, that I mentioned, um, they have seen much greater progress in terms of educational outcomes. Uh, whereas in Sri Lanka, we still have significant uh, failure rates at uh, ordinary level, advanced level, maths and science. Mm. Um, and so there's a clear need to invest a greater amount in education at all levels. Right. So even if you take uh, uh, secondary school, you still have a relatively small percentage of um, total schools in the country that have access to science teaching facilities, right. whether it's laboratories or science teachers. So naturally, those who come out of the school system, uh, even if they want to study science, may not always have that opportunity. right? So you have a divergence in many cases between the, the demands of uh, the private sector, the demands of employers, and the actual skills uh, available coming out of the education system. So there's a right. clear need to invest a greater amount in education across the board, whether it's primary, tertiary, or uh, secondary or tertiary. But in, in other countries, uh, it appears that they actively don't want people to leave the system without any form of training or and so on. Uh, I mean, in Singapore, I think it's about 5% uh, who uh, don't have anything, which is a small amount. Mm. But it appears that, uh, so wh what do you have to do? We have more investment in, in education? Absolutely, I think there's a there's a clear request. So if you look at many many we, we spoke about Sri Lanka uh, no longer being an upper middle middle income country, but we have a close to the threshold. Yeah, Sri Lanka spends a lot less on education as a per, as a percentage of GDP compared to most of the uh, uh, most of our income peers. So other upper middle income countries, higher middle income countries, they spend a far um, a far greater amount uh, on uh, on education as a percentage of GDP than Sri Lanka does. So that is one case, but there's also, I think, room for greater 
uh, for greater um, uh, private supply of education as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and Nishal, I'd like to also ask you now, with this, um, uh, you know, as we try to traverse beyond this uh, sort of rut of $4,000 per capita income, 7% of uh, our total economy is the uh, agriculture, yep. the agro sector. There's approximately 2.2 million people who are involved in that sector. That's right. Now, when the per capita uh, income uh, increases, what will this 7%, what will happen to the 7%? Will it come down? So I, I think what, what we've seen in, in many other countries is that you, you necessarily do have a reduction in the number of, in the um, uh, in the percentage of people who are employed in agriculture, mm. but what happens is uh, that human that uh, human resources get replaced by technology, yeah. right? So you can have a smaller percentage of people employed in the sector producing the same amount or even a greater amount of uh, of output. Mm -hmm. uh, so really, I think the requirement. So Sri Lanka has, for instance, potential in going into uh, more value added. Uh, production in the agricultural sector, mm. right? So whether it's tea or whether it's spices, whether it's a, a, a whole range of uh, the agricultural uh, uh, sector, there is opportunities for greater value addition. Uh, the great extent of what we do in uh, in the agricultural sector is relatively low value, and that generates lower, relatively low incomes for the the farmers as well. Now, the the agro sector, the exports, I think, uh, is worth approximately two thousand four hundred million dollars. Yeah. And the um, cost of uh, the fertilizer and all that total, approximately four hundred million dollars, mm -hmm. leaving us with about a net, if you like, of uh, two thousand dollars. Now, with this sort of move to an almost overnight um, ban on, uh, you know, chemical fertilizers and so on, and uh, the stated desire of the president of this country to go all organic, compare that with uh, the world uh, organic use, the, the figure is about 1.6%. What impact do you expect on agro-exports? So there, there will, I think, necessarily be uh, an impact in terms of uh, yield and productivity in the short term. So as you quite rightly said, um, it does require a, a phase-in period to be able to to shift from 100% uh, um, uh, inorganic uh, fertilizer use to an organic fertilizer use. So there are certainly challenges uh, that are associated with doing that in a relatively short time span. Mm. Um, uh, so I think there will be, there will be an, uh, an adverse impact on the yield, uh, of course, but at the same time, you do have benefits on the, uh, on the price side. Uh, I, I think what is important to see is whether, for instance, in this process of making this, sh this significant policy change, whether there has been substantial research done that's be that can... What is your information? Do you think uh, such... Uh, I, have, I, am, I have not seen uh, such information. Right. But I think that uh, analysis, uh, analysis is important to underpin any, uh, any policy move that is significant of this nature. And it's important that that is then debated and... Uh, we had the State Minister uh, Vidura Vikramanak yesterday uh, who was bemoaning the fact that data isn't being shared, mm -hmm. uh, isn't even available uh, to him, although at one point he was the state minister for, uh, in charge of fertilizer, uh, that uh, even though he requested it at the time of appointment and by the time he left his position, uh, he had still not got the data. So he was, uh, he was bemoaning uh, the sharing of data. In, in the same uh, sort of uh, space, um, do you believe that this is... Uh, a red herring, uh, a gimmick, because of a lack of foreign exchange. So I, I think that the the foreign exchange component is a part of the uh, of the motivation. Um, but again, I'm not convinced that that is a particularly uh, that that would have really great traction, right? So, for instance, if you said if you take four hundred million dollars, I think the most recent data is probably a little bit less than that in terms of the spend on fertilizer mm. um, and the exports of agro products being around two billion dollars. Um, so even a fifteen or a twenty percent reduction in the exports is going to negate whatever savings are made um, on the import side of things, right? So mm -hmm. um, so given this kind of very short term, uh, the very, very quick change in the in the policy, uh, that that exchange impact is also probably not going to uh, not going to materialize in a in a substantial. Way. As an, uh, I'll tell you what. Let's go for a short break. I'll come back with that question to you in a, in a few seconds. Let's.
go for a short break and uh, listen to what the headlines are for this evening's primetime news. News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukutali. And welcome back to Newsline Live. We are in conversation with Mr. Deshal Dimeo from uh, Verite Research. Uh, I was going to ask you just before the break, why, as an observer of uh, all things economic, I suppose, <laughs> and so on, uh, I'm sure you cast your uh, eyes and ears uh, far and wide. Why, in your opinion, do you think governments make such uh, hasty decisions? What what possible benefit is there for a government that's making such a drastic step, not when the economy is doing well, but when the economy is actually not firing at all? Mm. It's not just one cylinder less, it's many cylinders less. So why would governments make, uh, take this sort of uh, suicidal role in terms of PR and in terms of actual achievement? Why mm. would they say that? So this is a systemic problem in Sri Lanka, right? This right. is not something that is unique to this government. It has happened in the past as well. Yeah. Um, I think that's a. It's it's the problem is that there is often a lack of demand for uh, rigorous analysis, uh, whether it's from the government and actually often from the public as well. So the, uh, the, I think the public should expect should demand or expect that. Uh, any government policy that is uh, that has got material substantive impacts on society is backed up by uh, good analytical data and research and that research should also be in the available in the public domain for debate and for uh, and for scrutiny and it is really when you have data and analysis that is available in the public domain that improves the overall quality of uh, of that analysis mm -hmm. and then the overall quality of the outcome for society as a whole so I think it's important that uh, that the public, that the media, takes uh, really uh, demands from government that that there is a greater degree of analytical rigor in all of in all policy making uh, endeavors and also of data in general. Quite often we find a lot of Sri Lankan government institutions, for instance, that uh, that that do have access to significant amounts of data, but are not willing to make that uh, open in the public domain. Do you, do all of that is important to be to ensure kind of better the uh, better analytical rigor that underpins overall policy making in the country. Thank you. Uh, and now I'd like to go to some current uh, sort of uh, issues. Hmm. Uh, one, of course, was this uh, business about uh, the printing of money and the uh, impact on on the economy. We have the state minister in charge of the capital markets, former governor of the central bank, Ajit Nivad Cabral, who says that there's no relationship between the two. True, false, or mediocre? What is the real answer? So Sri Lanka, like many other countries, have uh, has endeavoured, has gone into money printing um, uh, during the during the pandemic and the in the immediate aftermath of the pandemic, right? right. Um, so the reason is we've run significant budget deficits. In 2020, we, we ran a budget deficit of 14% of GDP, um, and the central and the government wanted to uh, provide so the uh, central bank to provide deficit financing, which is mm. a formal term for money printing, uh, to be able to fund the deficit whilst keeping interest rates at a um, at a reasonable level as well. Mm. So during a recession, that that can be sustained. Yeah. All right, it's it's sustainable to have that because there is no alternative private demand that competes with uh, with the credit creation that comes with money printing. The the tricky part is when it's once the economy starts to recover, mm. right? So we saw that in the first uh, in the first th three four months of two thousand twenty one when lockdowns were eased in the latter part of last year, economic activity started to uh, started to come back from the private sector, and then of course all of the excess liquidity that is created through money printing then that starts to get loaned out. At what point does it become, does hyperinflation set in? So I think in Sri Lanka, more than hyperinflation, the, the first kind of, um, the, the first point of impact is really on the balance of payments. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you have excess demand, that demand either has to come through the domestic sector or through imports. Now, what we've seen all along in Sri Lanka in, in, in say, the last 20, 30 years is that uh, whenever you see economic activity taking off, it's, in, it's import intensive. Mm. So in, if you look at Sri Lanka, the structure of Sri Lanka's imports, about 80% of our imports are intermediate goods and capital goods mm -hmm. that are part of the production process. So whenever the economy is ticking, import demand comes in. Now, we are compounded by the fact that export growth has been weak. Uh, tourism has been non-existent, so the inflows have been weak, but import, dem import demand really picked up in early 2021. 
So that starts putting pressure on your balance of payments. It starts putting pressure on your reserves. So those are the kind of stresses that we have seen that are associated with the significant levels of, uh, of uh, money printing that we've seen in Sri Lanka in 2020 and in early 2021 as well. Um, I have a, a message from a uh, uh, viewer who says to me that uh, the total organic tea market in the whole world is 1.8 billion and uh, Sri Lanka's uh, export of tea is 1.6 billion. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, it's very difficult to sell large quantities of organic tea. That's right. Let's talk about tea. That's one uh, sort of statement as opposed to question. The mm. question is, um, with world uh, organic use only at about 1.6%, which we mentioned earlier, what do you think that Sri Lanka can achieve in the next, I don't know, six months, a year? In terms of supplying to the organic sector? Yes. How much of... How much can we convert into uh, organic? Uh? It takes time because I think even to get certification for organic, you need to have a, a number of years where the soil is the soil adjusts and uh, and all that to take place. But it's also more expensive. It is. So uh, can in, in when our economy is in the doldrums and we've just been down ra rated, if you like, in mm. terms of the per capita GDP and so on, can the pe will the people be able to afford all this? It. Uh, it will be a challenge, I think, which is why it is uh, again important that uh, there is, uh, you know, a, a before going into a, a significant policy change like this, that you have that analysis that shows you the costs and the benefits, uh, and then that enables, uh, uh, you know, a, a good decision making process. And so, when uh, will we be leaning on the IMF? When will we knock on their doors? How much worse should it get? <laughs> So if you look at in Sri Lanka has gone to the IMF 16 times before this, right? Yeah. And usually what the, the trigger is when reserves drop down to a, a certain threshold. Mm. Uh, so right now we are at about $4 billion worth of reserves. That was the as, as at end of May. Uh, and that's equivalent to about uh, two and a half months worth of, uh, worth of imports. Now in the past, say in 2009, Sri Lanka went to the IMF when reserves uh, were about one point uh, about one and a half, about six weeks uh, worth of imports. Mm -hmm. So it's it's hard to kind of actually get a sense of what exactly that that figure would be. But typically, it is when reserves come down to a level that is below a sustainable level in terms of import coverage. And um, <coughs> the the other question, of course, is um, why is there a reluctance, and why is the IMF? Uh, the last resort almost. So the thing for Sri Lanka is our, our problem is that we have, as I said, uh, relatively low reserve coverage right now, uh, but we also have substantial external liabilities that we have to meet, right? So through the rest of this year, we have about $3.6 billion worth of um, dollar debt that needs to be repaid. 2022, we have another $5 billion, and then between 4 and $5 billion per year for the next five or six years. Mm. Right? So there's a significant amount of dollar outflow, do dollar liabilities that mm -hmm. need to be met, and our reserve levels are quite uh, are quite limited as well. So in most situations, a, country, a middle income country, what they would do is they would reach out to global capital markets, raise capital to refinance the capital portion of the debt, mm. and then that on, right? So what happened to Sri Lanka is that um, in early 2020, we lost access to this global capital markets. We mm. lost the ability to be able to refinance our debt. So what we really need right now is to regain that uh, access to global capital markets. Now, for that, you need to signal confidence to investors, to lenders. Um, and one way to achieve that is uh, an IMF program. Now, with IMF programs, it's not the amount of money that is the significant or the material factor. Mm. Right? In, so if you look at the last program, it was $1.5 billion. And that's a small amount compared to Sri Lanka's total liabilities. Yeah. So what's important, though, is that signaling factor. Uh, an agree when a, when a country is in a program with the IMF, it signals to global markets that, look, this country has got a, a plan in terms of making its, uh, its debt viable. Mm. It's got a plan in terms of making its uh, fiscal balances sustainable. Uh, and then that gives confidence to lenders who are willing to then lend to that country. And then that enables you to refinance your debt and get back on track. The, um, if you like, from a pol politician's point of view, the downside of going to the IMF is that you can't be doing um, things that you'd like to do politically, hmm. uh, where it doesn't make sense. For example, 
I, I don't know if we were in an IMF program how dimly the IMF would view uh, an attempt by the Sri Lankan government to supply 590 plus um, sort of portable gyms. Hmm. Um, I don't think that would be on the priority list for the IMF. So, so interestingly, uh, Sri Lanka's problems in, in government finances is more on the revenue side than on the expenditure side. There's certainly room for greater prudence in terms of expenditure management. Mm. But if you look at Sri Lanka's government revenue, um, last year it came down to 9.2% uh, of GDP. Mm. Uh, and there's data on this that, that uh, Verita has put together on uh, publicfinance.lk. It's a mm -hmm. platform that, that captures public uh, finance data. So our, um, our government revenue is, as I said, 9.2% of GDP. That's among the lowest in the world. So IMF programs uh, in Sri Lanka have typically looked at improving that government revenue uh, aspect of it to really build to kind of uh, as, a, as a means of reducing, uh, uh, reducing budget deficits. So expenditure is certainly the problem, and that is, a, that is looked into as well. But really, the focus of a lot of IMF programs has been on revenue. Um, another viewer is telling me that it's, um, uh, it's tongue-in-cheek, probably. But um, this person is saying, is there a real need to have um, organic rubber? Because rubber is not eaten. And uh, where on earth, why should the rubber industry also <laughs> be subject to organic? Uh, Tongue in cheek indeed. <laughs> indeed. There is no. Uh, th thank you for that observation. Another viewer is very concerned as to whether there would be unbearable famine in the country in the next few months. Can you say anything to? settle this person who's asking this question um no i don't look i don't think we have a situation where we would you know go into in, in, into farming i mean uh, of course you would have declines in yields of uh, of agricultural product um but i'm sure that in in such an instance the government would look at uh, importing uh, importing those products that uh, that there are shortages in Right, um, Deshal, you know, um, we've come to the, um, to the end of the program, um, but very quickly, uh, you know, when uh, the people have been talking about the swaps and so mm. on, the currency swaps, so if India does a, uh, a non-dollar swap, does that mean that we can only ever pay things in Indian rupees? So if we take an example of that kind of swap, so in March, yeah. um, in February or March this year, Sri Lanka, and Sri Lanka Central Bank entered into a bilateral swap with the People's Bank of China, uh, which was a yuan swap. So in that situation, what happens is um, Sri Lanka Central Bank creates a rupee account uh, for the Central Bank of China, and Sri Lanka gets yuan, um, uh, yuan uh, in um, equivalent amount of yuan to, uh, for our usage. Okay. Now, in, in when it's a when it's a currency swap of that nature, you can generally only use that for imports. So we are in, uh, in another kind of a trap. We can only spend yuan. But that's not a. It's a, I mean, it's one point five billion dollars, right? So it's not right. a. It's, it's not, not a big. It's not the huge. It's not a huge portion of in, our overall. In comparison thing. to our overall debt. That's right. Deshal Dimel, thank you very much for being on Newsline Live. Now it's time for the prime time news, of course. And uh, before that, I'll say thank you very much for watching. Take care. And God bless. And uh, we are joined uh, this evening's primetime news. The uh, anchor is Azra Hassan. So it's uh, over to you, Azra, with the primetime news.